appreciate it so much the way you turned in your Bible and followed during the Bible class period. You can see kind of the way I deliver my sermons, and that helps. But however you listen best, whether turning in your Bible, looking on your phone, uh, as long as you're looking at scriptures, uh, and uh, taking notes, or uh, just sitting and listening. Uh, people listen in different ways. Whatever way you can best get the lesson, that's what I want you to do. But if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, I'm going to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. <clears throat> and uh, the song we just sang suggests what we're studying this morning. And that is God is able to deliver. And uh, that's suggested in Daniel chapter 3. But let me say again that it's so good to be with you. It's not my first time at Jones Road and in Corinth before you became Jones Road. And of course my dad uh, did his last seven years of preaching at Corinth. And so the group has always been special to us. And that goes way back. Dad has been dead, I believe, since 78 of, of 1978. Um, but held meetings back during that time with you. But, oh my, what a turnover has taken place. But it's great to be with you. Look forward to being with you. And I hope our studies together will be very helpful to you. I'm going to begin reading with verse 16 of Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver. But let's look at the background. Nebuchadnezzar has set up a huge image of gold and demanded that when various musical instruments are heard, that everybody is to fall down and worship the golden image. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of course, being Jews, could not do that. The pressure must have been tremendous. They're a long way from home a long way from anybody who cares about what they do. There's a governmental decree. Some people get the idea that if the government says you are to do something, you don't have any choice, you have to do it. That's not true. Peter put that to rest, didn't he? In Acts 5, 29, we must obey God rather than men. Everybody's doing it. Can you imagine when those musical instruments sounded and Everybody's falling down before that image. There stand Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They must have stood out like a sore thumb. There's impending danger. You're going to be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And I guess they could have rationalized. They could have said, well, you know, we'll fall down. Nobody knows, knows what's in our minds. We'll just worship our God while we fall down. And that would have been a compromise that was full, totally unacceptable to God. They could not do that. And then they were given a second chance. You know, sometimes there may be a situation where just on the spur of the moment, we might do what's right. But give us time to think about it. We might come up with a hundred reasons why we shouldn't do what's right. They're given time. In fact, they're given a second chance. Look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, 
At the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's answer is a beautiful answer. And although we've read it, let's read it again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. I like the fact they say, our God will deliver us. He's able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we don't serve your gods. And God did deliver them. Look at verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. and He rose in haste and spoke, saying to the counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What I really want to get across to you is the same God of heaven who saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from that burning fiery furnace is able to save us from a worse burning fiery furnace. And I'm talking about the burning fiery furnace of hell. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 7. I think we can get pretty well the idea if we start there. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hell is pictured as a place of outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, where there's no rest day nor night, Tribulation and anguish, indignation and wrath. Turn to Romans chapter 2. There's a very fearful statement made in verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I assume pretty well all of you are familiar with, East, with uh, Smith Lake, Coleman, and uh, Mary, uh, what's the other county there? Uh, anyway, Winston. I was in that country before Smith Lake backed up. You cannot imagine the deep ravines that you'd go through as you went through that Territory. I was preaching as a college student at Prospect out west of Cole. And on over the way was Persimmon Grove. And sometimes we would drive from Prospect to Persimmon Grove. And as we would drive, we would start down this deep, deep ravine and cross a bridge and then back up the other side. That's now leveled with water. I cannot imagine 
the volume of water that's in Smith Lake, having been in that country before it was backed up. Can you imagine? Here's all this water treasured up, to use the expression here, if the dam were to break. And all that volume of water. And here are people, and they haven't treasured up water. They've treasured up wrath. And one day the long suffering of God is going to be finished. And the dam will break. Hell is a terrible place. Separation from God eternally in a place where you never hear anybody pray, never hear the songs of Zion, never think of God except in the worst kind of terms. But the good news is you don't have to go to hell. The same God who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can deliver you from that burning, fiery furnace. He's able to deliver us from sin. Sin is the very cause of a person being eternally lost. I'm turning to Acts chapter 2. It's interesting that when the day of Pentecost began, you have these people, Jews, who had no idea that they would become Christians. As far as they knew. That Jesus of Nazareth was just an imposter of fake. They hadn't been deceived by that fake that had come. They had no idea that one day they might accept the Christ. But the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. They began to speak in languages which they had never studied. This pulled together a large crowd. And after the explanation of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues, Peter and the other apostles, I take all of them, began to preach, and they preached the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. And as they preached, these people came to conviction. Well, let's just read it. Verse 36, now when they heard this, 37, I'm sorry. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I've often said I don't have the inflection of voice. I'm not a very dramatic speaker. I don't have the inflection of voice to say that as they must have said it. Here they have been convicted that that one that they thought was nothing but a fake. And they had had a part actually in putting him to death. Now they realize they put to death their Messiah. The long awaited Messiah. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls delivered. God delivered them from their sin. From the prospects of eternal punishment. The God who delivered them can deliver you. He not only delivers from sin, he delivers from the fear of death. Go to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 2. Hebrews 2, let's start with verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partakers of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Christ, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. God is able to deliver, delivering us from sin, delivering us from the fear of death, And it's interesting, he's able to deliver us through death. Go to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is nearing death. You remember that. 
Look what he says in verse 16. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, in this case, he's delivered from death. He was, had been standing before Nero with the possibility of a sentence for death, but he's been delivered from that. But now look at the next verse. 18. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom to him be glory forever and ever. Uh, Paul, I thought you just said you were about to die. I'm not ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Timothy, I'm out of here. It, it's all over for me. And then he says, God's going to deliver me from every evil work. I don't know any interpretation to place on that, except that he's saying death will be the means by which God will deliver me. Think of all Paul went through. We'll be talking about this coming week. All that Paul went through in his service to the Lord, and now he's about to be delivered by death from all of that into eternal life. What a marvelous deliverance. And haven't we known the same? Haven't most of us seen maybe our companion or friend or whatever suffer and suffer and suffer? Might be Alzheimer's, cancer. My wife had a lung condition. And finally, they're delivered from that by death. And I wish we could Bring ourselves to see death more and more as that for the faithful Christian. God is able to deliver. I think of a man in Florence had Alzheimer's. I'd go by the nursing home. He didn't even know I was there. I went by for the family's sake. One day the phone rang. It was his daughter. And her first words were, Dad is not confused any longer. That's a pretty wonderful thing to say. He's been delivered from that. Our God is able to deliver. He's able to deliver from sin. He's able to deliver the very cause of hell. He's able to deliver us from the fear of death. He's able to deliver us from death if he chooses to do so. But he's also able to deliver by means of death. To Take us away from this old sinful world of suffering and, and dying. What a wonderful thing that we have a God who is able to deliver us. Do you know the Bible term, day of the Lord? It's, it's, it runs all through the scriptures. The book of Zephaniah, exact, especially, is just found... The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. The, what is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is the day of God's judgment against a people in which also he delivers his faithful people. Uh, by way of illustration, I don't remember it's being called this, but Egypt. Uh, it was the day of the Lord. God brought judgment against the nation of Egypt while delivering his people from the bondage of Egypt. That's the day of the Lord. Now, when Babylonians came against Jerusalem to destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, it was the day of the Lord. It's called that again and again and again. It's the day of the Lord. When he punishes, brings judgment against his rebellious people, while delivering his faithful people. One of the saddest of the Psalms, Psalm 74. You might want to turn to that. Psalm 74 is written by a man named Asaph. Now I take it, it, it can't be in fact, 
the Asaph that's a contemporary of David. Apparently, it's maybe one of his descendants, also being called Asaph. And as I read Psalm 74, it just seems rather evident that he actually is witnessing the destruction of the temple, the house of God. Start with verse 3. Asaph doesn't understand. Why isn't God going to step in? Isn't God able to deliver? Verse 3, he says to God, Lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. And now they break down his carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. Can't you just imagine Asaph's grief? as he sees the temple being destroyed piece by piece by piece. And why isn't God stepping in? He knows God is able to deliver. Why isn't God doing something? Look at verse 10. Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. Your hands, the head, you, you broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. Why aren't you doing something? Look at what you're able to do. And here you just are silent as the enemy comes in and destroys your house. We know why. They had turned away from God to idols. And in fact, Ezekiel 10 verse 18 just pictures the glory of the Lord leaving that temple. When the glory of the Lord leaves the temple. That's one sad day. And that's the day in which that temple is worthless. If God's not there, the very one who gives the worth to that temple has left. And God is gone. It wasn't the gold. It wasn't the silver that made that temple so valuable. It was the presence of God. And now he's gone. And it's fit for nothing but destruction. And the Babylonians come. And they destroy it. It was the day of the Lord. But there was a way by which his people could be delivered. We can name three of them. Well, I can name two of them. Jeremiah was delivered. Baruch was delivered. And I said I couldn't name the third one. It was an Ethiopian eunuch. Do you remember? He pulled Jeremiah out of the dungeon that they had cast him into. If I could remember his name, I couldn't call it because it's one of these uh, Old Testament names. It's so, so long. God delivered. And one of the sad things is Sometimes people will be longing for the day of the Lord when the day of the Lord's not going to be a good day for them at all. Go to the book of Amos. Hosea, Joel, Amos. chapter 5 Amos chapter 5 start with verse 18 woe to you who desire the day of the Lord for what good is the day of the Lord to you 
It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his head hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Here were people of Israel, the northern ten tribes, wanting a day of the Lord. Amos said, the day of the Lord is not for you. You're not going to be happy in the day of the Lord. It's almost as though you came across a lion. About the time you escape it, the lion, you come across a bear, and you finally escape it and get in the house and lean your head, head against the wall and say, Whew, and a snake bites you. I mean, you cannot get away from the evil that's going to come to you in the day of the Lord. And so it is today. There are people, no doubt, who would say, oh, if we just had the day of the Lord. Are you sure the day of the Lord would be a good time for you? That's the question. When the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, that temple that was rebuilt, it was the day of the Lord. And it's called that. These people had turned away from God, become so corrupt. And finally, God brings in the Romans in the day of the Lord to do the work that had to be done to destroy those, that nation and that temple. The day of the Lord. Turn to Matthew 23. You remember Matthew 23 is the chapter one who scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Notice how it ends. Verse 27. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to him, her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate. What's your house? I take it he's talking about the temple. Is left to you desolate. For I say to you, shall, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, all of those, and I'm not sure this is the right way to say this, but all of those days of the Lord point to the final day of the Lord. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Start with verse 10. Here is the final day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The final day of the Lord. And there will be the judgment. There will be the separation. God's judgment against this old wicked world. But he'll save his people. In that day. Will I be among those. Who will be delivered. God is able to deliver. Will I be among those who are delivered. Or will I be among those. To whom he will say. Depart from me. I never knew you. There's a great day coming. 
a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by when the saints and the sinners shall hear it will be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? We've told you what to do to be saved. We read it right out of Acts chapter 2. If you're not ready, why don't you respond now to the Lord's invitation as we sing those words. Let's stand.